All right, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I am Dr. Amanda Filial Perez with the University of Arkansas System Division of Agriculture. Um, today we're going to talk to you about UPIC operations and farmers markets in regards to COVID-19. Um, my colleague and friend Ryan Neal um, is going to talk to us more about UPIC. So Ryan, if you want to just introduce yourselves and then introduce yourself and then talk about your farm and then you can go ahead and start the presentation. Uh, sure, good to see a lot of uh, familiar faces and names here on the screen. Uh, again, as Dr. Perez said, uh, my name is Ryan Neal. I'm a county agent here in Benton County in the northwest corner of the state, but also uh, grow blueberries that we sell mostly for UPIC and have done so for about 10 years. And so, uh, you know, not only am I getting a lot of questions from strawberry growers in our areas, we're getting about 10 days out from harvest, starting to see a lot of red berries. So, you know, those folks are concerned on how they're uh, going to operate their farms this year. You know, but certainly it's uh, it's personal for me as well as we're about six weeks out of having blueberries. And so, you know, I did a lot of work this past uh, week just listening to different webinars and things that are out there um, about what other people across the country are doing. Uh, North Carolina certainly has a lot of uh, strawberries right now and a lot of strawberry farms. And so, you know, they're dealing with this. And so we're able to then take, you know, advantage of some of the information that's already out there. So I will share my screen. I put together just a brief slide set of, you know, some of the things that I came across while listening to you know these webinars and also just searching the web for you know what folks are doing and, and then also thinking through sort of issues that I would have on my farm and how I would probably try to address those or will try to. So kind of the first half is just going over you know some of the major considerations you know of course we are familiarized with these terms now uh, the hand washing stations thinking about that you know mapping the flow is also a term that came up quite a bit um, and just thinking through you know, those different pinch points on your farm and where people are going to be coming in contact with each other and then, you know, potentially feeling uncomfortable at your place, uh, social distancing and then sterilizing products. You know, so there's a lot of information out there of, you know, just putting out a hand washing station. Some of those can be done, you know, for as little as $20. This one was put together by the University of Minnesota. So kind of thinking through uh, what that's going to look like as you call your porta potty company, you know, they very well might tell you that they're out of hand washing stations because everybody now wants one all of a sudden, you know, buying those things new, you can spend, I think they're about a thousand dollars for those ones that you rent out from the porta potty company. So certainly if we could reduce the cost of that down to $20 and still be gap and FISMA certified, you know, just thinking through where people are going to be touching their hands. You know, this one is put together and is kind of certified. I'd certainly rather see some sort of foot pump or something that would get the water onto your hands rather than having to touch some sort of lever. Uh, but other things they have here, the trash can, you know, you can open the lid with your foot. Uh, they're catching the water. They're using single use uh, papers, but this is more likely put together before this uh, scare. And so trying to think through, you know, how can you make people feel comfortable? How can you wash your hands? How can you allow people to wash their hands without, you know, creating a place where everybody is gathering around and, and creating a, a potentially you know, a bigger hazard than um, if you were able to have you know, multiple hand washing stations throughout the farm that people can have access to. Uh, the part about mapping the flow, and there's some good information out there online, especially from North Carolina State University. They've got you know, actual maps of farms and kind of showing people uh, things to consider. And so this one has a small group waiting area. It shows kind of where people park. Uh, different places to place hand sanitizer and clean buckets for folks to pick up. But just kind of visualizing, probably walking through your farm, especially if it's a pick farm, but it would work uh, whether or not you have employees and you're just picking for farmer's markets or some sort of wholesale market. You know, a lot of these things will apply to uh, different types of farms. But thinking through will people park, you know, if there's any small gates that everybody's walking through where they're going to be, you know, uh, crossing each other closer than six feet, uh, where they stand in line to pick up buckets, then if they're going back to those, you know, same checkout lines to pay, and if those people are kind of coming in contact with each other. So, you know, trying to kind of think through the flow, uh, similar to what you see at the grocery stores and the changes they've made, you know, having somebody stand there with the carts and hand each person a cart that's then been sanitized right in front of them, and then you know, everything is kind of one way. You don't have a lot of people going back and forth. And so just trying to minimize the time that people are going across from each other. And this not only is, you know, helping to keep people safe, helping to keep you safe, but also, you know, there's a lot of peace of mind. I think if people show up to your farm and it looks very chaotic and there's kids running around on playground equipment and 
Um, there's just an opportunity to turn people off. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities here. There's a lot of demand for local food and for things for families to do, but there's also a lot of risk, not only making people sick, but also, you know, making it look like you're not handling your farm properly and, you know, it could negatively affect you then going forward. So just thinking through, again, the check-in and out parts of your farm and those pinch points, I think, are particularly important. Uh, you know, I'm considering, and, and probably for the first time, I've never been a huge fan of single-use plastics or single-use products at, at all, but, you know, this year it might be a good opportunity to put that plastic liner inside of your plastic bucket. That way you're just minimizing the amount of times um, that you're having to handle that product and sterilize it. Um, and, and so just kind of thinking through maybe doing things a little bit differently. You know, traditionally I have bought this uh, $1 bucket and everybody picks into that, but then I pour that bucket into a box. Uh, you know, this year it might be a good opportunity just to let people take that bucket home with them. You know, they might want to then bring it back later on, but at least it would give me an opportunity to sterilize it in between and kind of keep those separated. And so, you know, just different things to think about there as far as packaging goes. Uh, as you've seen at different grocery stores, you know, they've got uh, tape on the ground that shows people what six feet looks like. They've got a, certainly additional signage out there. You know, how could you make that work at your farm? And you know, certainly I think spray paint could be a good opportunity if you've got places where normally people are lining up to pay, you know, maybe have spray painted lines so people know what six feet looks like. You know, and that only, not only just reminds people, but I think it just generally will help people feel safe that you're doing your part and that they, you know, feel like someone's not going to be going rogue that doesn't know this information, although I don't know who that would be, but you know, that just that everybody's sort of on the same page and it's constantly being reiterated and just making people, people feel comfortable. Of course, additional signs is probably a good idea as well. You know, the uh, ag department has sent out these new uh, signs and we've got those on our website as well, but certainly having that posted, especially for your employees so that they know what to look for. You know, somebody offered earlier that, you know, they might, you know, take everybody's temperature as they come onto the farm. You know, uh, that would certainly be a decision that you need to make as well as even opening for you pick, you know, but certainly if you are going to just, you know, making sure all your employees are also on the same page um, and everybody knows what to expect. Uh, different sanitiz uh, sanitization products are out there. I've, uh, for the last few years, used a, um, a food grade wipe that is a single use product. It comes out of, you know, dispenser and I've wiped down all of my buckets in between use. Uh, that was made out of a product that is not actually listed on this EPA website for types of sterilization products that are known to be effective. So if you do have a product that you're, you know, used to using, just make sure that is actually known to be effective against this type of virus. Uh, the generic recommendation, and you know, I'm not a huge fan of using bleach around the farm more than I have to, but you know, this would probably be a, a good resort is just five tablespoons of bleach per gallon, which would be uh, a higher concentration than what we're used to using around the farm and for things like salmonella. And then uh, those are kind of things to think about on your farm. And, and sometimes it's just nice to talk through those. And I'm certainly happy to do that with anybody that wants to, you know, the other part of it is kind of creating an online uh, presence for yourself. If you are kind of on the fence of doing so, then you certainly might consider doing so now. I know that uh, uh, Heather will probably speak to this a little bit as well, but you know, some people uh, just polling them think that you know sites like Squarespace do a really good job of allowing you to create your own website, and so that might be worth looking at. Something that I never have in the past, but you know, if we're heavily relying on Facebook to do all of our communications and advertising in the past. You know, I've just noticed that that's getting bogged down pretty quickly with everybody being home and probably posting more than they used to, but also you know, a lot of organizations are just putting out things. You know, Facebook in general is also posting a lot of things just about the you know, uh, live meetings that are going on and different information that's coming on about the virus. And so I'm just afraid that Facebook might not be as reliable this year as maybe it has in the past. People also might here in a month get tired of looking at Facebook um, because of the information that's on there. And so just maybe not relying on just one single source of social media to get your message out. And so if it ever was a time, you know, to develop a website, now might be a good one. They have packages as low as it looks like $300 per year, depending on what features you're looking for. You know, one uh, market up here, uh, it's a restaurant, Farmer's Table in Fayetteville. They uh, recently kind of pivoted their operation from being a restaurant to being a 
a local food source. And so they had on their uh, Squarespace website created an online market. You know, I hate to have to see everybody create their own online market. It would be nice if we can work together or work through other organizations like Farmers Tables or other organizations that are having to pivot. So if we can, you know, create a pretty simple way to buy things online and uh, keep people from having to meet at farmers markets if they're not able to, uh, then that's certainly, you know, an option. A lot of new things are coming out there as far as being able to advertise. Uh, this is just two years old, but probably a little bit dated, although I haven't seen a newer one. It just uh, is an online platform comparison uh, chart, which will allow you to kind of go through some of the different uh, websites that are available to sell your products directly to, to customers. Uh, Barn to Door is one, local food marketplace. A lot of these you've probably been familiar with before. Um, and it'll kind of rate them and go through some different pros and cons for them. And so it might be worth looking through that and seeing which one might work best for you. The University of Arkansas does have a communication, ag communications department, and they have ag communications students that work for this experimental, experiential learning laboratory. Um, and so they can develop a website for you if you don't feel comfortable doing that. They have done uh, some flyers and things that I've seen in the past that have been super informative and very professional um, and they work for $16 an hour and so I've been back and forth with them and they figure you know, their average website costs about $500. If you've got all the information and pictures that they need and they can put that together for you for as little as like thir uh, $320 or you know, about 20, uh, 20 hours of work to put a website together for you and so that is ELL .uark.edu. So you can reach out to them on this website. They have an online form you can fill out and they'll get back in touch with you depending on what your needs are. I've also looked into, you know, as far as a UPIC and probably would apply to a lot of other types of farming enterprises, but uh, Google Forms are really helpful. Um, this one I put together really quickly just to kind of think through what that might look like. So, you know, an opening day of a strawberry farm traditionally might have you know hundreds of people show up and it's a really exciting time. Um, I, I'm afraid that that probably would turn people off just thinking of a hundred people being there. They might not show up and then all of a sudden your opening day doesn't have anybody there uh, just because everybody thought it was going to be crowded. And so you know this might be a way you could create an online uh, Google Sheet that is uh, live and can be edited by whoever you choose. So this would be one, for instance, you could put together, you know, with the times that are available at your farm, you know, the row numbers. And so people could actually sign up for a time and a row that they're gonna pick with their family. Um, this could be a, a spreadsheet that you, you know, created and, and you make a shareable link. You put that on your Facebook page, people can have access to it, they put in their name. And that way you have like an online reservation form that's pretty easy to take care of. Uh, it doesn't require people calling in, having to make reservations, which could take up a tremendous amount of time. And so, you know, you could do both, but for more of the savvy people um, that are used to using computers, they could sign up themselves. You could also make this so you create it and update it. You share the link, but you don't allow people to edit it. I've seen where one uh, Kimball and Thompson produce up here in Lowell. Uh, they have sort of pivoted from being able to provide produce just to restaurants or predominantly to restaurants to being able to provide to the public. So they just put this uh, spreadsheet out on their Facebook page. I, I clicked on it and then every day I can go back to it and it's updated with their products that they have available and the prices. And then I just can shoot them an email and they'll have whatever is available on this list um, at their warehouse within an hour. And then they're very you know, nice about loading it into your car for you and then you pay for it online. And so there's no real interactions that are happening there. And so, you know, a few different ways to do those Google Sheets depending on what your needs are. There's quite a few other ones. I know a lot of us are used to using uh, the Square readers. You know, you have the one that you swipe that you plug in on top of your phone that comes for free. You know, for $40, you can buy this one that you stick the chip into. So I could see where you could, you know, Velcro that to a post or something. People stick their, you know, card in. They don't ever have to touch you. You don't have to touch their card or anything like that. And that might be a pretty slick way to do it. And that's all run by Bluetooth. Uh, Square also, I notice, has a free appointment uh, maker and so you could actually do those same reservations with an appointment on that square um, site. I've also seen other sites are you know doing the same thing one two three form builder 
There's a Google Forms. Talk is a like a restaurant reservation app that's kind of pivoting to be able to provide things for farmers. And then this one again is Square. Um, so just additional kind of considerations. I looked at a lot of information from the North American uh, Farm Direct Market Association. They had some really good roundtable webinars I was able to listen to and get some fun ideas from. You know, a lot of those big farms up north are dealing with the same thing, but even with uh, greater shutdowns, you know, we are continuing to be a, a source of food. And so we are essential uh, component to the community and, and in a lot of cases are, are seen as being even more important than ever before. And so, you know, as a grower, it's certainly up to you whether or not you open up for you pick or uh, just pre-picked, but we have certainly seen from around the country and the state, the demand is there. Um, it's just making people, people feel, you know, comfortable and confident with what you're doing and decisions that you're making, you know, just like at a farmer's market where you can operate those, but you can't have live music and you can't have um, cooking demonstrations. You know, if you've got a playground or something on your you pick strawberry farm, I would certainly consider closing that down. I don't know that any amount of sanitization would, you know, help the public perception of keeping that open. So, you know, just kind of limiting to the essentials. Um, other websites besides the UAX one, which is great, uh, would be, I think the Clemson website did a good job of walking through a lot of you pick um, considerations, North Carolina State University. You know, additionally, it might be worth having a conversation with your insurance provider. Generally, communicable diseases are not uh, something that is covered by your insurance policy. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, you know, it'd be very difficult to prove that someone got coronavirus from your farm, but that certainly wouldn't mean that you, you know, didn't have to fight it in a court, which could certainly cost a lot of money. And so, you know, I've always told people, you know, maybe don't ask the questions if you don't know, want to know the answer, but in this case, it'd probably be worth having that conversation with your insurance provider and just, you know, making sure you're on the same page there and limiting your risk as far as that goes. You know, I think there's a good opportunity for also partnering with other growers that maybe have products that you don't have and that way you're not both creating online presences whenever you could probably, you know, be more effective if you work together. Um, and then, you know, just, we're kind of all in this together and so reaching out to your county extension agent or you know, I'm happy to walk you through any of those considerations and sometimes it's just nice to talk through them you know as we get ready to open and you know for some growers it's not really an option if you've invested tens of thousands of dollars in a strawberry crop um, you know you don't have a wholesale account and a farmer's market account or your farmer's market is closed you know, some of these things are probably going to be necessary. And so, you know, just knowing there is an opportunity there, but there's also a great risk. So anyway, well, thank you for letting me, you know, share this with you. I just wanted to go through it quickly, but um, I'm happy to share these resources with you or you're welcome to you know, reach out to me. And there is my email address and phone number. Thank you. That was really helpful. Um, I really appreciate you putting in the information about the online platforms. That was a topic I was going to cover, but you did a great job on that. Um, all right, um, I am now going to share screen and um, let's see here. Looks like we have a few more people that have joined us. Um, if you could um, go ahead and type in the chat um, who you are if you've just joined. Um, if you're a farm, your farm name, a farmer's market name, or if you're a business or organization who you're with, if you could do that for me. And then we're also going to put in the chat some information about um, Rip, if you wouldn't mind doing so, put in um, the link to our COVID-19 uh, website. Um, there's a, a long list of buttons to push on and a, and a number of resources beyond just what we're going to talk about today. Um, there's also a lot of resources at the Arkansas Ag Department. So Karen, if you could put in links to the Ag Department resources on the same subject, that would be helpful. Maybe some links to those posters, which I think we have linked on our website now as well. Um, but there's a ton of resources out there for you. So, all right, well, we'll get into farmer's market guidance. Um, you may um, have over the last week or so seen the um, guidance that has come out through the Arkansas Department of Health and Agriculture um, related to opening a farmer's market. So over the past couple of weeks, um, our program has received, I guess in the last three weeks, I can't tell you how many calls about should we open markets, should we close markets, how do we do that? And I'm so glad that the 
departments of ag and health put out guidance on that. But then now that those are out, we've had a ton of questions in regards to what the guidance means. So we thought we would just do um, an overview of the guidance and then we can kind of talk about case by case how that relates to different types of farmers markets. Um, so if you're just joining, uh, Dr. Amanda Filial Perez here. I'm a food systems and safety specialist with the University of Arkansas System Division of Ag with the Cooperative Extension Service. All right, so farmers markets in Arkansas, um, we, we know that as we continue to try to flatten the curve with COVID-19, um, a lot of people are starting to really take this seriously. We're practicing social distancing. There's been a push to, um, to address how we operate. Um, we know that um, it's been recommended not to, to, to go out unless you need to for essential things like food. Um, but farmers markets were really um, under question because they are usually at a social setting where we go and lots of people interact with families and kids and music and crafts and all of that. And so um, um, some guidance were put out by the Ag Department um, a couple of weeks ago and they have said that farmers markets are critical infrastructure. So because they're food, um, they can be open, but you need to use certain practices to be able to do that. So we're just going to kind of walk through some of that. Um, in the guidance, it says that if markets are in unenclosed outdoor spaces, they are allowed and encouraged to be open. I would like to make a point of clarification here because we do have some farmers markets or food stands that are operating either in restaurants, bars, um, churches, um, mom and pop grocery shops, um, and other places like that. Those markets are allowed to be open, but they have to use certain practices for social distancing, which we'll talk about in just a bit. Um, all right, so uh, there's also been some questions about the types of things that can be sold at farmer's markets. And in general, in the guidance, it says that only food products can be sold at farmer's markets. Um, Following that guidance, we had a number of individuals call the extension service either through county agents, have called me directly, asking about things like personal hygiene. So um, many of you probably know at farmers markets, we have soap, um, chapstick, other um, health and hygiene items, and now lots of people are starting to make masks. So I contacted the health department and they said that we are allowed to sell some personal hygiene products. They did not give a list and they did not say that they were going to put out a new guidance on that. But they did say that personal hygiene products are allowed to be sold. However, they do not want items such as craft items, um, animals, um, clothing, baskets, um, art, or things like that to be sold in, at the markets at, at this time. And then as Ryan already pointed out, um, anything that would attract a crowd, we really don't want at farmer's markets this summer. So cooking demonstrations, musicians, performances, or other things that would attract a crowd. And we want people to focus on what we've heard in the news for the past three weeks, and that's really social distancing. So the question is, how do you do that um, at a farmer's market? Um, you have to really think about if you're going to open the market, how you set up the space. And what we're seeing in other states and in Fayetteville, this top image to the top right is in Fayetteville, where they've actually um, allowed for um, spacing out of where people come in and they enter a parking lot and then they allow people to come in um, with a sign. Um, they're using an online purchasing system and then they're kind of mapping the flow uh, based on what Ryan was pointing out. But really, they're looking at if you're going to open your market, you can do that by having some kind of drive through if your market is able to do that. Um, you can space the vendors out really far apart if you're able to do that. Um, you can do online ordering with pickup only and they can be routed through um, to drive up and then pick up based on their order. And so you really want to think about how the market's going to be set up so you don't end up with bottlenecking. And I like the example that Ryan gave of um, if you are going to allow people to walk through that you're creating that social distancing as well. And so with, um, with the farmer's markets, in the guidance, you are allowed to have an open market where people are able to walk through, but you have to map the flow and put social distancing practices in place. 
And so if you're gonna have an open market like what you see here, there's a recommendation to space the vendors out as much as possible. Um, if you have the option of a drive-through, that's gonna be best practice. But if, if you need to, if you don't have the option to allow cards to go through, you can space the vendors out as much as possible. And then um, some of the best practices are creating hand washing stations, putting up signs, um, to uh, to encourage them to practice social distancing and and then for vendor practices what we really want people to do is to continually use some kind of disinfectant spray on the contact surfaces so if you're going to be having people coming through and it's not just a, a pickup you need to think about uh, cleaning and sanitizing Ryan shared with you um, a list of the types of sanitizers that are allowed bleach is probably the best thing to use um, and then um, with the hand washing, the same practices we've been hearing over the last couple of weeks is uh, soap and water for 20 seconds. And then um, encouraging vendors that um, if, you know, it's allergy season, that if they do have to cough or sneeze, to sneeze in a tissue, a sleeve, or an elbow. And then cleaning frequently um, throughout the day um, as the market is open. And then this is kind of just something that's really should be understood. And that's, you know, not allowing for food sampling. I mean, I think that's kind of, really understood right now um, with the social distancing practices. And then if you're going to open the market and you're going to allow people to flow through, but you're going to practice distancing to allow the people to flow through, you want to consider um, bagging items for customers, putting things in units before you even get to the market day. Um, and then um, if you can, um, to offer them to make those purchases in advance through some kind of online ordering system, that's going to be best practice. <laughs> Um, we don't want people kind of going through like we traditionally see in a market setting where they're just going to walk through and just um, self-service. Um, that's, that's not um, really allowed at, at all. And then um, if you are going to allow people to go through the market, you may um, at, the, at the beginning of the market have a hand washing station and some hand sanitizer before they even go into the market. And then if you can um, do online ordering, um, this is an example at the bottom right of what uh, the Fayetteville market is doing. So people are purchasing through the online ordering system, driving through, they hold up a sign with their name and someone brings them all of their food. And then using the digital payment options, which um, Ryan covered um, some of those. Um, but in addition to creating an online platform, you wanna think about how you will accept payments. And there's lots of apps that are available now for how to do that. So um, it's, it's recommended that you use some kind of electronic payment rather than using cash or credit card. If you have to use a credit card, then you want to, when accepting that, try to have um, disinfectant wipes to wipe the card off um, when you accept that from, from the customer. But there's PayPal, Venmo, Cash App, Square, um, and all these other types of payment systems that you can just download an app and most people are pretty familiar with those. If you are going to transition to an online market and accept that, you can accept payment online prior to market pickup and then that'll just be confirmed. Um, if people wanna pay at the time of the market, you'll need to communicate with them about what type of cash app or other platform you're using. And then you can also post signs at the market with the kind of um, platform that you're using. Um, if you if you are in a rural community and people don't necessarily use um, smartphones and apps as often, um, you can accept cash. You may want to think about pricing things in units to where you're only um, charging them to hold dollars rather than having to work with dealing with change. And then if you are going to accept credit cards, as I said, make sure to use a sanitary wipe and gloves before returning to customers. And then um, if you're looking for an example of an online marketplace, we just wanted to point out the, that the Arkansas Local Food Network has done a really good job. They've been doing an online market for 10 or 12 years, I think, um, if that's right, Katie can let us know. But um, we, they've been doing a really good online market. You can kind of go on their, their website, see how it's set up. Um, and then they've also been using some really good um, social distancing practices. So people are coming um, online, placing their orders, then on the day of pickup, their orders are um, packed safely um, by um, individuals that are volunteers. And then, um, then there's scheduled pickups for them to just come and pick those up. This uh, market is inside of a church. And so 
um, as people come through, they're able to kind of practice social distancing, their order online, and then they're able to pick up out of the parking lot. And so here's just some instructions for how they're going about doing that. So if you want to just take a second to, to look over these. So these are things that you might want to communicate to um, the customers about um, prior to coming to the market. So if a customer is exhibiting symptoms, um, they probably shouldn't be the one coming to pick up um, the food. You can give them instructions about where to pull in or park so that they can pick up their online order. Um, if they want to use um, a sign or if they want to text when they've arrived, if there's a phone number that they can text and say, I'm here and ready for my order. Um, and then um, someone who is working to distribute that um, can let them know when it's time for, for their pickup. Um, and then practicing the distancing um, where cars can get in a line or if people have to get in a line, you may want to put down um, um, X's on a parking lot or something like that to make sure that people are keeping their distance. And then um, People are emailing or sending invoices for payment um, in other ways, either through text or through email rather than um, doing a paper invoice. And so if you're looking for um, just kind of tips to do that, you might want to look at the Arkansas Local Food Network website. And here's just an example of kind of um, what they've done and then the Fayetteville Farmers Market as well. So Fayetteville has really done um, a really great job of getting this off the ground. And the guidance that was written for the state is really built off of, of the model that they've created. And so uh, Heather Friedrich is on the call today and she wanted to give us um, kind of an overview of how the Fayetteville and other Northwest Arkansas markets have been set up. So I'm gonna turn it over to Heather to talk. Thanks, Amanda. Um, yeah, so I work with uh, about eight farmers markets up here in Northwest Arkansas through the Northwest Arkansas Farmers Market Alliance. And um, so most, most of these markets um, have not opened their you know, physical marketplace except with the exception of the Fayetteville farmers markets. Many of them have just um, are, are de delaying their opening date. Um, but the downtown riders and the Bentonville farmers market are using the what's good app. Um, and then the Fayetteville, um, the Siloam Springs Farmers Market, and then uh, pretty soon the Springdale Farmers Market is also going to come on board with um, the locally grown app. Um, but uh, as Amanda mentioned, the Fayetteville Market is the only one that actually has a, a physical marketplace. They do have, you know, all these markets have their online ordering system. So it's, you know, just come and pick up um, the day of, and um, with most of those, all that payment is, uh, you know, importantly, it's it's made ahead of time. With the locally grown um, app, it's been a little bit of um, uh, an education process with uh, with um, uh, consumers because with a locally grown, you don't have to pay that order before you. Um, uh, before you go pick it up, you can pay it on, the program gives you the option of paying it right on site. And so the Fayetteville Farmers Markets had a little bit of a, you know, an education process with their, with their consumers. I had orders with them both last week, um, well, the first week, which was, uh, I guess it was two, well, two weekends ago. Um, that was the first uh, weekend they order, they opened up with the, that online system and then last week as well. And so last week they had 350, over 350 orders online. And so as you might imagine, that's uh, a lot of orders to process. Um, and they do that all with the volunteer labor force um, you know, before the market, before pickups start at 10 o'clock. And so, um, but they, they have done a really good job of impl implementing practices um, to really minimize any kind of um, uh, COVID uh, transmission. They, um, everybody is wearing gloves and, mat and face masks. Um, all the volunteers, even in the physical market, all of the vendors have uh, face masks and are wearing gloves um, with the, pickup process it it has they have been tweaking that a bit just to make it a little bit more streamlined could because as you might imagine that's a lot of orders to um you know for for pickup um so they 
have made some updates from the first week to the second week. The first week, everybody was pulling in and backing out. They had three mar three sp spots for that, and that took up a lot of extra time. Whereas this week, they changed it so everybody it was just pulling in. They had three lanes where people were just pulling into, and then you know you tell them your name, and then they also made um, did a better job of communicating that all orders were to be paid on online before they were to get to market. Um, they the Fayetteville market does um, quite a bit of business with um, SNAP EBT users. And so with that, they have, a, and you cannot pay um, ahead of time with those customers. So that is the, you know, instance that they do, um, you know, make that transaction right, right at the, the marketplace. Um, but um, aggregating all those orders, it takes about 15 people. Um, and, and that's from like 10, using those people from like 10 in the morning. Well, actually it's pickup starts at 10. So obviously it starts before that, but um, through one o'clock is the last ordering process. And so this week they, you know, broke it up um, a little bit better too, because customers, you know, A through F or A through G, you know, their last names beginning with those letters were to come between 10 and 11 o'clock. And so that like really streamlined that process a lot better this week too. Um, but in their physical market, you know, they're, you know, implementing all the um, recommended practices, you know, the, the, the vendors are at least 10 feet apart. Um, they have the hand washing station and the hand sanitizing uh, option is there as well. All customers have access to gloves. Um, um, Many vendors have gone to, you know, these contactless pay payment systems or reduced contact contact payment systems like Venmo and Square. Um, and at, at a very, you know, low tech option, um, you know, some of the vendors are, you know, all of their, all of the incoming cash is going into a bucket or a jar or an envelope or something. But then all of the change that's needed to be made comes from the change that they bring to the market that they, you know, sanitize ahead of time or spray with bleach or something like that. Um, so that way it's just kind of um, reducing, reducing the potential there. Um, and you know some of the some some practices some other practices you know um, some markets are have kind of a, a social distancing watchdog. Um, I mean everybody takes that responsibility on a little bit, but um, at each at each market someone really has the responsibility for policing that effort. And then at each stand, you know someone. Um, has also has that responsibility to make sure just to make sure that you know people are doing their due diligence for social distancing um, yeah the um, other the other markets that are not you know opening right now um, uh, this I mentioned the Springdale farmers market they are looking at um, early May and then the other ones are just kind of you know playing it by ear um, just to you know, when the when the uh, things you know look better, but you know I think a lot of the changes that are taking place are are something that's going to be something that's you know going to be uh, in place for a long time to come. So I think that's a, that kind of um, gives a good summary of what's going on up here. Okay, thank you, Heather. Thanks for the detail on that. Um, so. In general, um, we are encouraging that markets do open. Um, we have heard that there have been some mild, nothing too serious, but mild shortages within some supermarkets for some of the things that people are looking for. Um, we anticipate that some of those things may happen over the summer. We're not expecting any large food shortages. But, um, people are looking um, to support support small business. Um, so hopefully we can continue to open and operate safely this summer through our farmers markets, our UPICs, and, and all of these innovative um, pop-up shops um, that are happening at restaurants and bars and other sites as well. Um, so that's that's the general guidance that we have, um, information about how to do UPIC, best practices for farmers markets, mapping the flow, all of that. Um, in the comments, um, if you are kind of new to Zoom, 
if you move your mouse um, around the bottom of the screen, you'll see the chat box. And if you open that, you can see some links to resources. So we've got resources for our extension COVID page. We've got resources through the Arkansas Department of Ag and, and their COVID page. Um, and then um, they have an access map that they've been working on to kind of cite all of the food sources within the state and are now working with Uplift Arkansas, which is also cited here, um, to link to food sources across the, the food value chain in Arkansas. And then um, there's a couple of other things. Um, so Katie Elliott with the Arkansas Local Food Network said that um, anyone who's interested in understanding their best practices, they can reach out to her. Um, Katie, do you wanna put your contact information in the Zoom chat? If anyone has questions about that but um so um they even though that they're operating out of a church and they typically use a volunteer program within the church to do all the packing and then people would usually come in and gather their items and they would um take those and then check out um they've really stopped that now they're doing um they're separating people who are packing um, within a phys you know a physical distance of six to ten feet while they're doing the packing and then they take those online orders out to the street and individuals will drive up and pick those up and then on those tables that they're working at they'll use a disinfectant to kind of spray that down in between so many clients all right and katie's information is in the chat um, so we have some time now for um, questions. So we've tried to put most of these resources um, into the chat box. So um, the Arkansas Farmers Market Association is posting information. There's a, a National Farmers Market Coalition with more information. And then if you have any questions, um, feel free to reach out to anyone on my team. Angela Gardner is working um, mostly on our Share Grounds project. Rip Weaver has been working on some local aggregation with our share grounds, Julia Fryer on our produce safety, and Lisa Brown is our administrative assistant. All right, um, so here's my contact information if you need to get in touch with me about anything. Um, and then you can check out, keep up to date on some of the things that we're gonna be sharing on our local foods page. But I'm now going to just kind of open it up um, for discussion to talk about anything related to UPIC and farmer's markets. And then kind of after we answer those questions, then we can um, really get into any other issues or support you need in local foods this summer. <laughs> 